Good afternoon. My name's Eric Knight. I'm the Executive Dean at Macquarie Business School and welcome to the Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series, uh, Leadership in the Digital Age. Uh, before starting today, I'd like to acknowledge the Wadamadigal people of the Darug Nation, whose land uh, we are conducting today's interview on, uh, and to their elders past, present and emerging. Well, uh, this afternoon's talk uh, is with Gus McLaughlin, and it's a great pleasure to invite Gus on to Macquarie University today. Gus is one of the country's uh, most distinguished military leaders, 37 years of service. Uh, relevant, I think, um, to today's discussion, and there's more bi biography on Gus uh, in the notes preceding this, is that he is responsible for generating Australia's defence capability across a range of different areas, cyberspace, electronic warfare, command and control systems. Uh, and at the conclusion of his career, he led Land Forces Command, uh, which was responsible for training and employing 35,000 uh, women and men in the Army in a diverse range of fields. So it's a great pleasure to have you here today, Gus, um, to talk a little bit about your experience. Now, one of the things to note about Gus is that in, in the last little while, and coinciding with the COVID um, crisis, uh, he transitioned from military career into moral. And so part of what I was hoping that we could talk about today in the context of the digital life that we've had to lead over the last 18 months, two years, is how the attributes of uh, your leadership experience and, and, and experience as a leader in military has transferred into your um, corporate experience at Borrell. And in particular, how, you know, what are the sort of top five tips that you would take that have translated into that new environment and, and what that might mean for us as we all think about uh, leadership in this digital age. So, yeah, welcome and thank you. Thanks for having me. It's, 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 great, uh, it's great to be out here. I, I have to warn everybody, I don't mind a chat about leadership. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's so fundamental to, to uh, our, our role as leaders in businesses to get this discretionary effort from people. And, um, I, and, I, and I love talking about it. Uh, it'd be great to be able to do this face to face, but that, the reality of, of, the, um, of the world we're in uh, and, and hence the, the discussion that, that we're about. So uh, thanks for having me and I look forward to, um, to you know, perhaps meeting as many of the, um, of the uh, participants in uh, future and a later engagement. Absolutely. So let's start with, um, I suppose, tip number one here, which is leadership must be based on a foundation of ethical behaviour. Can you, can you talk us through this and, and yeah, talk me through your experience and how you think it uh, applies to the digital age? You know? Yeah, look, you know, just, just to, just to to quickly touch on on your introductory comments there, because I think it's interesting talking leadership. A lot of the audience might start with an assumption that um, military leaders are all about um, command and control style leadership, just simply telling people what to do. In fact, I've had people make an observation to me that in business, oh, Gus, look, you must find this hard because you'd just be used to telling people what to do and they jump three feet, and run off and do it. And, and the reality is there's an extraordinary privilege that your fellow citizens bestow on you when you're a military leader that you have this uh, authority to give a fellow citizen a lawful order that, that actually can often lead to putting them in danger. But you employ that in the absolute most extreme circumstances. The rest of your time you spend uh, seeking to train, grow, mentor, develop a team that it can actually respond uh, on their own when you're not there under difficult circumstances build their resilience so not a lot different to what most modern businesses would seek to do and you know I think as I as we went um, my arrival at Borrell almost exactly coincided with the emergence of the global pandemic and I have to apologize up front because I, I do tell people that it probably helped my transition into into business leadership so I would apologize for wishing a global pandemic on everybody to help smooth my professional career. But what I mean by that is I had spent my leadership career preparing to make decisions in the face of uncertainty. As a general rule, military operations are you know, unplanned, reactionary, uh, often at short notice, and you make a series of assumptions. You try and put a structured decision-making process around your art, your, your, intu your intuition and experience, and you do the best you can, and then you evaluate those assumptions over time. So as we um, started to hear of this virus emerging from Wuhan in China, I think one of the instincts that I brought to Borrell was a sense that this was coming out of China and it would be a, a pandemic. And so, you know, saying to the business, look, I'm only new, most of you don't know me, but I really think we should do some assumption-based contingency planning. And fortunately, I was in a business where people said, that sounds great, Gus. Now you lead it. 
uh, let's get on with it. And, mm. and I think that was a, a good experience for me to start to work out how the, the two worlds, that military world and my business world, were going to, um, were going to work together. So going on that, that point about having to build the social fabric, you know, for mm. the decision making, not just command and control, h- how do you go about doing that in an environment where, you, you know, you don't always see your colleagues? I mean, I was saying to you last night, yeah. I, we had an event here for the Dean's um, Distinguished Students Awards and uh, many of the staff and students there, I actually hadn't met since I'd come mm. in, um, but digitally. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in that in the context of, you know, field forces and the extent to which you've had to run or think about running sort of remote teams or teams at a distance and, and yeah. how you set yeah. up communication control and, and how you structure and organise that at a distance. Yeah, look, I, I, I'm, it, it's fascinating. This, um, this, this world of digital um, leadership has is, is been something we've actually been pursuing in the military for decades hmm. because um, you, you have dispersed organisations and you want to be able to... Um, you know, to, to move, to, to have them execute missions without having to keep recalling them back into a central location, give them instructions and send them out. And in one of the uh, pivotal experiences of my early career, and, and many people will have, will, have, will have heard of it, perhaps even seen the movie they made about it, was this movie became known as Black Hawk Down. It was an um, a American helicopter that crashed in the streets of Mogadishu. And I was in early, uh, I guess early stages of my leadership career, I was seconded across to the United States to work in the in the United States Marine Corps, and the mission they had given themselves was the, um, sending in the rescue force was incredibly difficult. The streets mm. were blocked. There was very difficult getting messages. Command and control was incredibly difficult, and they lost many lives having forces lost in the streets of Mogadishu. But at the same time, there was one of the early um, Mars rovers was being command and controlled on the surface of Mars. Mm. So the challenge the US military gave itself is we can we can manoeuvre a rover on Mars, but we couldn't vector a relief force into the streets of Mogadishu. And so militaries have been looking at this thing called digital command and control for a long time. Now, a lot of the purists would w- w- were very resistant, not that different to business right now, I might add. So well, the purists said, well, if we lose that face-to-face conversation, we won't be able to impart our leadership. We won't be able to hear fear in people's voices. It will become mechanical and decentralised. Yeah. I've heard the same conversations yeah, during sure. COVID yeah. as we sent people home. You know, we, we, we won't know whether we can trust them. How will we engage with them? Um, and, and the reality is you've got to lead and you've got to lead differently and you've got to, you've got to work out ways to do that. And what the military chose to do is they always left a voice channel uh, in parallel with the digital data. So you would try and do the, the, the administrative control activities, locations, per, perhaps resupply requests, etc. could all be done digitally, keeping channels free. But when you did need to impart confidence or hear the fear in somebody's voice, you would keep open a voice channel. So as we look at leading in a, in a kind of in business environment, perhaps not as extreme, but interestingly, what we found at Borrell, our Melbourne-based employees in their fourth lockdown, lockdown actually been important to hear voices and hear the stress on people and the pressure that it's that it's put on people so not that different uh, to the analogy that I gave so you know I think I think the challenge is to recognize this is the future we, we can't turn it back but what's the equivalent of keeping that voice channel open and it is the still the human contact is absolutely critical um, leaders contacting their team um, you know following up discussions little short messages opening up a dialogue on on social media or, or your business yammer or whatever that mechanism is. So that person feels an individual connection. They are very similar traits to what we what we experienced in the military. Very interesting. So just to, to play that back and see if I've understood this point, Gus, that you know, if you think about the role of leadership as actually, and management as, as ha- being segmented, you know, some activities which are more routine and you know, clear task specificity, um, e- easily defined, mm. can be quickly digitised, automated, roboticised, and, and you can proceed autonomously. But other areas which maybe rely on judgement, human trust, uh, interpersonal connection, you know, innovation, you've got to elevate to, to a human voice channel and, and, yep. you, and you can't really digitise those things. Yeah. At the risk of, of, of um, perhaps in, a, in an academic institution crossing boundaries of management theory, um, I personally separate the terms leadership and management. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. So management are those transactional things that that you know you, you you just described. Leadership 
is the emotional connection mm. that elicits the discretionary effort of that team member. Mm. And, you know, discretionary effort I define as, you know, most people will, will give their, and this is, this is just a number I make up, but most people will give that first 80% because that's their professional responsibility, they're being paid a wage, they, they value their professional reputation. But they withhold an amount of effort, um, which is theirs to give, and they give that to leaders that inspire them, whether it's through, uh, you know, we talk briefly about, you know, whether it's through ethical behaviour, whether it's through a, a personal connection and care for them as an individual, whether it's through simply profound professional knowledge and respect. Those are the things that, that leadership uh, for me, differentiate out from management. So first tip here is around sort of leadership and its foundation and, it, and its human dimensions and its ethical dimensions. Can you then maybe talk to your second point here about sort of professional mastery? Mm, and, mm. and maybe just a way into this is to sort of think about this in the context of, um, you know, and, I, and I'll let you, you lead on, on this, but, um, you know, are you talking about particular skills here or are you talking about mindsets? Maybe you can sort of open into that. Yeah, yeah look, th there's this debate in leadership discussion around the leader that's born or made. And there are some people who are lucky enough to be born, uh, you know, as char charismatic, empathetic individuals that people warm to and others are very comfortable following them. Um, for those of us not... Uh, equipped that way, I, I, I think it's really important, and, and perhaps for the audience, for for students studying leadership, you you know that you, this you don't have to be a born leader. Leaders can be made, and what does leadership being made means? It means, in my experience over many years, both with soldiers and now in business, people will follow someone who they believe is doing absolutely everything in their power to 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 master the professional environment and have them be as successful as possible. Um, you know, I've, I've seen relatively awkward young army officers followed by, you know, robust, experienced soldiers because the soldiers recognise the young leader has studied everything they possibly can, is doing everything they can to be successful, and they know the leadership skills and the, the charisma and, the, and those things might follow. So the first point I'd make to people, you know, is that if, if you don't feel like you're one of those natural uh, charismatic leaders, it doesn't mean the end of your leadership career. What it means is you, you, you've got to work hard to be seen as a leader who people follow because you're just good at your job, because you work hard, because you are trustworthy, reliable, uh, and that people working for you know that you will give them every chance of being successful as a group. Mm. So moving this into a particular part of the square then, say in the context of the last you know, 18 months, two years, and, and the digital context, mm. I'm sure there have been plenty of people in organisations, leadership and otherwise, who have probably felt a lot of fear in the last two years, mm. uncertainty, um, job insecurity, amongst other things. Mm. I mean, what's how do you, how do you how do you I mean, with, you know, without um, wanting to dismiss those things, because how do you lean into them? How do you kind of respond and and um, and and approach those genuine moments of where you don't know what's going to happen, where you've got anxiety, you know, uncertainty, insecurity about job, you know, amongst other things. Yeah, yeah well, Eric, you use that term, you use that term genuine, and and I think as part of engendering trust between a leader and their team, um, much used term, but I but I think it's an important term is authenticity. So. Um, you, you, you probably are sociopath or inhuman at, if you don't feel fear or apprehension at times. Mm. So there's no good in pretending to be fearless, mm. um, but, but what you can do is, um, is, is explain to people your, your feelings, but then um, give them a sense of hope and optimism. And I use the term, um, you know, realistic optimism. People don't want, um, you know, don't, don't, don't want to be lied to about the situation. One of the things we found at, at Borrell early on in the pandemic was the the very first communications that our CEO put out, we, we made it optimistic. What we said to people, we're in a global pandemic, we don't know a lot about those, but here's what we know. Mm. We live in the best country on the planet with a wonderful health system, a relatively healthy population. We're in a big listed Australian company that will be here at the end of the pandemic. And we got a, a lot of feedback from our workforce. So that was a, 
a sort of a deep breath moment where people went from, you know, oh my God, what is going to happen to actually, you know what, we are going to be all right. And that didn't take the fear away or it didn't take the uncertainty away. But everything we said was true. So I think it's as a leader, the circumstances are real, but it's ability to, 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 to look at that and, and I guess put it in context and make it, mm. make it uh, appropriate. Now, you, you can't tell people things that are not true. Mm. Um, and so the reality of, of, of any business, including ours, was that we had to forecast and, and that, that sort of military thinking that I talked about was we did some wargaming, some contingency plans. Mm. We, we assumed let's do a plan for 25% loss of revenue, 50% loss of revenue and total government shutdown. And I don't know whether you remember, but that period uh, just before Easter last year when those scenes of uh, thousands of people on Bondi Beach forced the Prime Minister to go on television, I think it was the Monday following, and talk about we might have to shut the country. And, you know, for, for businesses, we weren't sure what shut meant, and so we immediately went into crisis action planning mm. where we're going to have to, to close our, our sites, etc. Now, you can't mislead people about that reality, but by doing that thinking in advance, by setting up those conversations where people knew, again, they were lucky to be working for a big Australian company that weren't going to leave their, 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 their conditions and their leave and yeah. so on. So you can't take away the fear, but you can do the preparation and be open and, and, and honest uh, about the communications and the reality. Hmm. Just staying on that point of fear, I mean, you know, I, I, was, I was saying to my wife the other day, yeah. <coughs> been a tough couple of you know weeks in the office and, and you know we're talking about um, work and jobs and so forth um, she's a medical doctor so when she's dealing with fear she's dealing with things that are literally life and death and I just wondered from your experience in the military where you know where you're training tank crews mm -hmm. infantrymen to go out into battle you know they've got a particular fear what's what's the what's the skill what's the leadership what's the training that you um, give our, our our men and women in uniform when they're facing that kind of fear. What, what's the what's the bracing mindset or moment that you train them to have? Mm. You know, interesting as you talk to them and, and and including my experience, fear is always there. So what you have to put in place is, um, you know, is world class training and skills. So, um, you know, let, I'll tell you a story about a um, and he won't mind me using his name, uh, Seamus uh, Donahue. His name wasn't. I'd, I was um, preparing forces for Afghanistan, and you don't get to meet all of the, uh, the, the individuals that, that you deploy, but I met Seamus because it turns out he, uh, his father was a, a military veteran, and, and um, um, I met them at the farewell barbecue. Seamus was shot through the thigh on his very first patrol in Afghanistan, and um, he was uh, evacuated back to Australia, and, and, and about two weeks later I saw him in hospital, went to visit him in hospital, and he said to me, you know, God, boss, I feel like I've tripped over the boundary rope running onto the grand final. I, you know, I feel like I've let my team down. Um, and um, but what I what I said to him because what the what the leadership had passed back from Afghanistan was his reaction to that incident was textbook. So he uh, he had to tourniquet his own leg. He, he knew that he drills. Um, he he had to. Uh, uh, um, changed the magazine on his weapon, he'd, he'd put some suppressive fire so the, the medic could recover him and then he blacked out through loss of blood. But all of that kicked in and so when I said that to him, he said I didn't even think about that because mm. I had had the training and, and I'd had the simulation. And so, you know, this notion of the military exercise, I think most people understand the military trains a lot and, and hopefully deploys very rarely. What we've introduced the notion of the simulation at Borrell, mm. and we mm. simulated um, a, a COVID detection in our workplace mm. because we knew that's what people f feared. So mm. out at our sites, we made them go through. There's a COVID detection on this mm. site. We, 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 sh we showed the call out of the professional cleaning process, the, the notification process, the reset. And after that, people felt less fearful about that because they could visualise it. Mm. So you can't take away the fear, but you can... Uh, you can train people so that they know how to react through that process. So tip number three about ownership. Can you talk us through this one? Us? Yeah, look, I, 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 there's a couple of, lots of things wrapped in that. But, you know, for all the uh, students of, uh, at, a, at a business school, um, you know, they're, they're aspiring to be leaders. And the term leadership 
it's the answer, right? Leaders mm. are out the front. Mm. Um, and so leaders have to be willing to stand next to the biggest problem. They have to accept um, the good and the bad. You know, COVID arrived um, when it arrived. We didn't get to decide what was a good time for it to impact uh, each of our teams. So we have to own um, that reality. There's, a, there's something else that I talk about, and, and, I, and I, I might put out some a few written notes after this, but I, but I talk about leaders needing to be right a lot of the time. And, and that's a bit counter, I think, to perhaps some other um, you know, modern leadership theorists which would talk about you don't have to be the smartest person in the room. You've got to use all of the brains that are available to you. And I think that's all mm. true. A great book if, if people want to read uh, something that it's, that's, that's about a military context but I think has been beautifully interpreted, um, a, a book by Marquette called Turn the Ship Around. He's a, a, an American Navy officer who took over a nuclear submarine that had been rated the lowest performance rating in the US Navy. And within 18 months, it had gone to the top of the, the US Navy assessment process. And his big message was there were 180 people on board that submarine. He wanted to use 180 brains to solve the problems. But that doesn't take the responsibility away from the leader to professional mastery, to know their job, and to be right a lot of the time, because that's what you're there for. So, um, you know, for those who aspire to leadership roles, be willing to stand out the front, be willing to take some knocks, um, and work as hard as you can to be right a lot. Can you say a bit more about this idea of standing next to the biggest problem? Because mm. I, re mm. I really like this one. And... You know, we've only got a certain amount of hours in the day, you know, days in the week. And so where you spend your time and making sure it's against the biggest problem is, a, is probably the most important thing yeah, you have to do. Yeah, How do you yeah. identify the right problems? I mean, you could, you could, you know, you could be looking at the numbers, you could be looking in the eyeballs of the people around you. What's the, what's the biggest problem? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you an example, Eric. Um, and, and, you know, it's from my old world, not, not from my new world. I was the senior campaign planner in, in Afghanistan for a fantastic um, American general. His name was Mark Milley, and, and for many of your um, uh, students may have uh, seen this American general who was, was caught up in that incident in the riots in Washington following the, uh, the Black Lives Matter protest where President Trump made that um, scene of moving across to the church. Mm, yes. And, and, and in the entourage that he took across with him was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, a man called Mark Milley. Milley came out um, days later and apologised to the US military for being caught up in that and politicised and, and, and the military being politicised. And it was, it was a really significant um, statement from American military leader about, about um, Trump's behaviour. Well, he was my boss in Afghanistan. And... I was uh, the, the senior campaign planner and the job he gave me was to plan the drawdown, 180,000 people, and he wanted it down, in fact, President Obama wanted it down to 15,000 by the time we left. Not a trivial exercise. So I thought I was working on the most important job that he had going around. And um, there was a, a, a period where I just couldn't get access to him because he'd gone to stand next to a bigger problem than mine. And, and what had happened is they'd detected uh, some intelligence had come in that a, that a massive uh, truck uh, bomb had come across uh, the, the border into uh, Afghanistan. And if it had gone off near American or coalition troops, it could well have caused the end of the war in the sense that political will might have, mm. might have been withdrawn at that point. So he went down to the area where this thing was supposed to be. Now, he didn't practically add a lot of um, experience. There were lots of experienced people down there. But what he was demonstrating to all of the leadership was if we didn't solve that problem first, mm. the other stuff that I was working on might be, uh, <laughs> might be overtaken by events. And it taught me a, a lot as a leader. You know, while I thought I was working the most important issue, um, you know, he was showing through his presence and his leadership, this is the problem that I want you all to make sure we, fi we fix first. And, and, you know, I think that reality of uh, acknowledging as leaders that the fun stuff, the easy stuff, we've got subordinate mm. leaders who mm. are often more than capable of mm. solving. What they want from us, they want our help fixing mm. the big problems. Mm. Um, and so, you know, where you put that effort, um, sometimes, you know, when we're talking, you know, massive truck bombs, it might be obvious, sometimes it's not. But I, I think being conscious 
about where you are and what you're showing is important to you is, mm. is going to be an important way the organisation knows, you know, where its priorities need to be. I mean, what I like in that story as well is the is the move of a leader straight to the front line as well, you know, not to kind of do it from a distance because you often get the rough hue of the detail that way. It reminds me a little bit in a very different context, but of, a, of one of the best articulations, I thought, which builds on what you've just said, Gus, of leadership was actually someone I was once interviewing for a job. Now, you know, they, they were looking to, to move sectors and they'd come from the restaurant industry, which was not, not an area which I was working in. Mm. But I asked them the question around how they thought about leading a team and they, and they told me about how they trained people to set tables in restaurants. And they said, first time I do it myself. The second time I do it alongside the person. The third time I watch, I watch the team. And I thought that was, yeah. you know, that, it's about laying cutlery, but, you know, that, mm. that principle could apply to a lot of different things. <laughs> and, you know, lead, lead by example is, a, you know, is, a, is something, again, a lot of people have heard that term. And, and often, as you get more senior, you can't be a master of every skill in your organisation. Yeah. But what you can show is that you're willing to do the right thing all the time. At a big company like, like Borrell, where we've got people, trucks, explosives, absolutely critical in that leadership by example is your safety example. So wherever a leader goes wearing the proper safety equipment, not cutting corners, uh, you know, not, not looking at their phone when they should be focused on a task. So even though you might, I, I, I don't know a lot about drilling and blasting in a quarry wall, but I know that whenever I go to a site, I can lead by example by doing all of the things that I should be doing properly, mm. um, you know, in the right way. And, and you know, I think they're, they're, that's the sort of things that leaders need to think about. Now, whether that's, um, you know, it, whether that's in, a, in, a, in an audit function or whether that's a governance activity mm. or th mm. there's always a way to show the proper diligence. As a, as, a, as a very senior army officer, I used to go into the storehouse of the units that I visited and do what was called a 10 item spot check. And, you know, they would lay out things that I would, you know, we would check that where they were supposed to be. In reality, what I was really doing was getting a pulse of the, uh, of the, of the people in that store, was governance being done properly, etc. cetera. But, but by seeing to do those relatively mundane tasks, mm. people, you know, are, are aware that it's mm. better not be beneath them as well. I'm going to go to the fourth point now, which is about communication. And, and I wondered if you could say, say something about this, in particular in the digital context. Mm -hmm. I say that because, you know, we're, you and I are sitting here, it looks like we're in a TV studio, there are 450 people dialled in here. Quite by the way. And, <laughs> so we can communicate, but I mm -hmm. think the thing for me is how do you listen? Yeah. How do you listen in a digital age? I, I'm wrestling with that one. How do you, how do, you do that? Yeah, it's, it's such an important point at the moment, um, Eric. And... and Again, I don't, I don't mean to sound trite. I have uh, three rules of leadership. You know, three rules of real estate, location, location, location. Three rules of leadership, communicate, communicate, communicate. And as you say, part of that is the outward going communication, which, which, which we're doing here. But at least 50% of it, and perhaps more in a senior leader's role, is, is how do you listen? And so, we, you know, we talk about in this digital era, um, you know, what tools do you set up? Now, I do think it's important that leaders use forums like this, use recorded video uh, to, to put themselves out there. We, we've had feedback in Borrell that, that our workforce really appreciated getting to know their senior leaders. And in fact, they felt better when the polish came off the videos. Right. My boss was, was, you know, became a COVID uh, refugee back to Perth. And instead of sort of having a, 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 a professional uh, contract, he put a GoPro on top of his laptop and filmed the videos. Hmm. And interestingly, the feedback was uh, even more positive because there was a feeling of authenticity about that. So hmm. video, an, an outgoing expression of who we are, what's important, hearing that emotion, concern, fear, whatever coming through. But in, a, you know, in this digital environment, we have to um, uh, you know, adopt the tools of, of the two-way communication. I'll, I'll tell you a simple story. I, I, when I was... Um, Commander of, of Land Forces Command in the Army, 36,000 people, people spread from the Torres Strait to Tasmania. And um, I decided to embrace Twitter as a medium for professional military discussion. Now, Twitter's got many, many faults, but if it's used in a positive way, it can be a great forum for just expressing um, professional ideas. And on a Saturday morning, um, I was at home Quick flick through my Twitter feed, and there was a there was a, a, a tweet there from a um, 
a young woman in Townsville, the, the lowest level commissioned officer in the army is a lieutenant. She was a, a, a lieutenant in Townsville and she'd started a young officers book club. Wanted to create a professional uh, group in, in Townsville to, to, you know, to read um, uh, military history and have a professional discussion. I think it probably took me two minutes to, 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 to tweet her to say, wish that sort of thing was around when I was uh, at your stage. Fantastic initiatives, here's three books that I recommend. And then I went on with whatever I was doing. Now that feedback I got later was that reverberated through the, the junior leadership in that brigade. Oh my God, the general yeah. communicated directly. Uh, you know, that's fantastic. And, and we, we had a couple of other uh, exchanges. Now she would never have sent me an email yeah. in a thousand years. Mm. Um, and so having uh, the ability to have a two-way discussion at times for leaders in the right context, incredibly powerful. Another simple example, we had an Army Reserve Brigade doing some bushfire preparation and they, and they work on a Saturday morning. Similar thing, you know, one of the leaders um, just tweeting that they were doing this rehearsal activity and I think I said something like, I hope you're not needed, but if you are, I've got complete confidence that you'll do a fantastic job. Community is lucky to have you. And again, this sense of the, the, the boss is engaged, knows we're here, um, you know, gave them a sense of, of connection. Now that was a simple two-way exchange on a platform. In that case, Twitter. It might be a company Yammer. Yeah. It might be, um, you know, it might be, a, you know, a company Facebook or Instagram. But that two-way connection incredibly important. Um, and you've got to fight through this caution. And and a lot of leaders, and perhaps you know, my generation, are very cautious about uh, technology and yeah. about making a mistake of saying something that they shouldn't. Um, I think you've got to work through that. Um, and if you can create that connection, I think it's exponentially powerful. Just building on that in, from a different angle, I'm interested in, in how, and maybe this is more a management than leadership point, but um, you know, there's obviously a move towards business analytics and being able to kind of sense check organisations at scale or you know, pulse check things. Um, one of the things that I've recently introduced into my senior team is basically a traffic light. Each We have a, a, a Monday uh, leadership meeting and going into that, they'll say, you know, work level, stress level, you know, red, red, orange or green. I'm just interested, you know, when, when you, how, do, how do army teams deal with that? How, how do you begin to get a pulse check to work out you know, how people are either, you know, working or feeling at, at scale when you, you, know, you don't have the chance to listen to everyone, you know, but you do want to get a feel for where the organisation is at. What are the kind of analytics or tools or techniques that you can begin to render that? It's, at a, it's, yeah, it's a great question and it's a, it's a really important question. Um, I just, I'll, I'll make the, the, the digital comment uh, up front. You know, there are some businesses who have felt through this decentralised work environment that they need to have monitoring tools on how many keystrokes and how much right. screen time right. their employees have had. Um, if you are doing that, in my opinion, it, mm -hmm. it, is, it, it should only be in people that you are performance managing with a view <laughs> that they are, they are no longer suitable for your organisation. Now that's not to say measurement is, is, is important. What I think is more important to measure is what is the cadence of connection? Mm. So, you know, it, it is important to measure. It's all very well for Gus to say, communicate, communicate, communicate. But ha have I checked how many people clicked on, you know, opened my video? Um, you know, my incredibly powerful, charismatic video in the middle of COVID might have had 2,000 people in the business. But if we're down to 600 three videos later, it's my responsibility to change and adapt that messaging. Um, you know, what, what is the take up rate um, between, you know, different forms of communication? Do I have a quiet spot in my team? And I think as we look at forming a team in a digital environment, how does that new person in the team feel confidence to inject in that, in that meeting? Are you keeping a track of, has that person had a chance to have a say? Can you reach out separately and say, hey, listen, I'm going to throw to you in about 30 seconds time, love your opinion on this, on this topic. And so I think it's important to measure. I wouldn't be measuring keystrokes. I would be measuring engagement connection? and connection. Um, and, and, and then was the second part of your question, I think I've... I've military, is that how, how the military do these? What are yeah. the tools that they're doing? At yeah, well, well, so we do, we, we, have, we of course do measure connection because frankly, what you... What, you, what, what inexperienced leaders often assume their message has 
reach the intended yes. recipient. And, and when they awesome. haven't, it's catastrophic. Yeah. So assuming someone's heard your message in the military is, 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 is a really fundamental error. So pursuing your message all the way to, to the um, recipient is, is important. In a digital sense, that's, that's making sure the data packet has made its way through. Um, but, but often it's follow up with the, ra- with the quick radio call do you get my message? Any question? Again, that's when you hear the, the you know, the, the confidence, the emotion, and so on. So, firstly, you know, in the military, it's critical that you make sure your message is getting through. Um, and and the other one is that what I call that leader to leader conversation. At the end of each day, when I was a, 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 a an army brigade commander in a very well equipped digital um, system, a huge Internet of Things where everything's connected together. I still made time in each evening for um, almost a digital fireside chat, so all informed um, radio net. Yeah, right. Here's and, and, and two things I did. I, I, I used that to say, here's what I think is happening, and actually being willing to be vulnerable because I might have been wrong, but saying, look, of all the of all the things that I sense around us, this is my interpretation. Now, how are you all? Feeling and what's your view of the same thing? And we created this environment where we got the fireside chat and the two-way uh, piece. Now, the thing they took from it, if the next day things rolled out as I had expressed, they didn't need to come back and talk with me. They knew what I was thinking. If it was different, mm. hey, boss, it hasn't mm. turned out to be as you expected. So I think creating that, mm. um, always finding time for those, um, you know, that leader-to-leader engagement how are you feeling? Do you have confidence in what's going on? Do you agree with my interpretation? People feeling safe to contribute. Mm. Look again, easy to say, but mm. you know, teams that are mm. that are, are you know are feeling that mm. like they can engage are really powerful. Mm. So, Gus, take you to the f- last one, tip number five, which is leadership as a team activity. Mm. Can you talk us through this one? Yeah. Well, I guess we sort of just touching on it there, and I, and I, and I used a couple of prompts in in this. Um, I, you know, I love um, history, but I think importantly, as we're talking about digital stuff, history is is only important so far as it gives us an understanding of of what's possible. But also, I call it a a, a foundation for agility. You know, you, 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 it's it's like it's like stepping off mm. one foot when you when you want to change direction. So, one of the one of the great um, studies, I think Abraham Lincoln created this thing called the team of rivals. So, as he was running for president. The other candidates for the presidency were huge personalities, and uh, and 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 quite a lot of animosity. And in fact, he was seen as a country hick. He was roundly, um, um, you know, criticised and attacked. But when he formed his cabinet, he brought these people together on the team. Now that takes tremendous confidence to know that you can uh, you can then corral those big egos uh, and big perspectives, but turn that into a team. Well, interestingly, the first Obama administration was a team of rivals. So Hillary Clinton right. uh, and, and, and you know, other rivals. Now, I think for a leader with confidence to know I'm going to get this really dynamic, challenging conversation, but what you then have is a leadership expectation that at the end of that discussion, when we all lead the room, we're going to be unified. Mm. Hard to do, but I think powerful if, you've, if you can achieve mm. it and you've got the confidence and you've got the buy-in from those leaders to say, we're going to be dynamic. We're going to be questioning of each other. We're going to challenge, but we all accept that when we leave the room, we're going to mm. we're going to be aligned. There's another model that um, uh, you you might call the team of teams, and 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 General Stan McChrystal again for those who want to do some uh, reading on this topic. He he wrote a book called Team of Teams, and he talks about that special operations environment where the, everyone's a trusted professional. Everyone's expected to have have a view, but very strongly aligned. Um, again, I think that's important. But what the, the point is that the team is more powerful than the mm. than the individual. And, and I did, and I used that um, example of David Marquette's book, uh, "Turn the Ship Around." Why not have 180 brains working out what's going wrong on this ship, rather than the captain trying to give every order from you know from from turn left now. Uh, to, you know, why is the nuclear reactor overheating and so on. So I think for all of us, we've got to make conscious choices about mm. about what is our style. Um, do we feel comfortable with that, with that team of rivals? Um, 
you know, if not, and not everyone will, well then let's go for the team of team team of teams approach and really expect everybody to have a high level of understanding of each other's context, high level of empathy for the circumstances of our of our leadership team colleagues, uh, and really strong unity of effort. Um, you know, they're all valid. It's really about working out what um, what's best for you. But I think I did get some questions during COVID from other business leaders. You know. As we went, as we were months into it, and and leaders were starting to get really tired, and 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 actually people's health was was suffering. You know, Gus, how does the military approach that? And I think it is through that notion that while you are ultimately in charge, you do learn how to share the load. So you know, a, a senior military leader will have a sergeant major um, and a, and a leadership team that um, that know how to share the load. They understand the leader's intent. When the leader's not there, they know how to continue to pass that message. So in business, it's it's about you know building a team where uh, you don't need to be there all the time for the right thing to be happening. Building on that, and, and I, I like the idea as well, you know, just being a strategy professor as well, about the clarity of intent. I mean, you know, often we talk about this notion of agility and innovation, which is in another way describing intent change. You know, how, how then as, as a leader, because often, you, you know, you might be, you've got an intent, stipulated and articulated, but something new has come on the plan. And in, in your head, you're trying to work out, or you might be thinking, you know, do I need to change intent? Have we got the right? How do you work through the processes of intent and intent change? You know, when does the mission change? And how do you, how do you work out where you make a decisive shift versus when it's still just a bit of a thought bubble that you're percolating? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the use of, of, of intent is, a, a, in my opinion, a really important leadership tool. So if you can express um, what you, uh, your vision and what you seek the organisation to do, yes. when you're not there, leaders can align yep. in that vision. Now, that's, that's a, a pretty straightforward thing. I think most people would understand that. Um, what, what military leaders are taught, if you're a subordinate, you're expected to do analysis of what your leader needs leader two above you is intending. So the idea is you're always trying to work to that, that higher leader's intent. Now what you expect a senior leader to do is do in their planning, the planning's got enough detail that you've done that analysis too down to say what I'm intending is possible and achievable within the resources that are available. Um, and of course the, the ultimate test of that, um, uh, of that intent based leadership is the simple question I used to ask my, my soldiers if your boss is not here, what would she or he want you to do if the circumstances in front of you change? So you've been, you've been told to, to, to cover an area with reconnaissance to look for an enemy scouting force, but you pick up the scouting force in the next valley over. Yes. Well, do you sit there and look at the blank bit of ground or do you redeploy yourself to, mm. to cover the, the new approach? Now, of course, if you have wonderful digital connectivity, you send a digital update and everyone knows what you're doing. But for any reason you don't have that connection, I would expect that that simple you know, example that they would move over and, and, and meet the intent. And in, in, you know, in business leadership, I think that same applies. Now, how do you go about changing direction? I think most people will have, will have heard this trite military phrase, you know, the, the plan is only, uh, only survives until first contact with the enemy. I think my, you know, lots of military leaders have probably said that. Eisenhower, <laughs> was, Eisenhower was famous for it, though. That, you know, planning is only, only survives until first contact with the enemy. What a lot of people don't know is there was a second bit that came to that, which, which was, but the planning process itself is more valuable. Yes. So if you've sat with the team and yeah. you've been through all those yeah. scenarios, you've listed your assumptions, yes. everyone knows what the various things that you considered were, and when the situation changes, again, most of them should be thinking about mm. already adap adapting their, their reaction to that uh, intent mm. that you would have. So your organisation's more agile because you've had those conversations. Mm. And I, I go back to the early days of COVID at Borrell, we, we created this, this war game of plausible scenarios and none of them actually played out exactly as we expected, but everyone knew the different steps that were embedded within that. So when we went to describe the steps, most people had already had contingency plans in place for each of them and we were much more able to, mm. to shift our position. So the planning was more valuable than the plan. Mm, interesting. So Gus, I've, I've tried to pick up some of the... Um, alumni and student Q&A 
in the in the mix of questions, but one or two things we didn't quite um, cover up, and I might just go to these before we close out today. So and maybe it's an elaboration on that most recent point, but it's a focus on the kind of cross-functional nature of teams, mm-hmm. you know, where you've got the kind of IT team and then you've got the kind of, you know, the business unit team and uh, amongst others. And I'm sure, you know, there are going to be military analogies to that. Um, any thoughts around how you convene that, how you get the cross-stitch to kind of get the innovation? Yeah, look, I am a, I'm a cross-functional disciple. Um, you know, I think I think what's really interesting about how you how you create that sort of agility is you do get, uh, you, you know, you get as many stakeholders uh, in the room uh, as you can. Now, I think what the bigger challenge is is how do you grow the par- you know, let's call it the parent expertise, so that each time they come into that cross-functional environment, they're masters of their part of the discussion. So I guess there's two ways you can organise a business: you can have those permanently organised cross-functional teams or you can bring them together as needed. I always find that what you want people to do is be able to go back to their parent part of the organisation, skill up, get the additional context, get the professional development and growth, and then come together as a cross-functional team. Um, and, and, you know, I think, I mean, I'm sure uh, Macquarie University is the same. My experience at, at Monash University is, is as, a, as a, um, a customer of research and development, what I don't want to do is uh, have to reach down and look at um, additive manufacturing and then myself go and broker the data analytics piece, um, you know, and the, the um, AI machine learning and the human factors input. I want a cross-functional team that will bring me a solution to, to my problem. So the idea that you can just go to your, your, your CIO or your, or your digital leader and have a problem solved, almost always now the problem has connection into mm. other areas of an organisation. So organisations that can bring together those disciplines in a solution for a customer or for an internal stakeholder or for a leader are going to be much more effective than those who are insisting on each of them coming together as a silo. Um, firstly, customers won't, won't, won't wait, they won't have the patience. And, and virtually no solution that we all put forward now is, is a single discipline. If Borrell tries to just sell concrete, but not understanding that the customer wants a digital interface where they can see where the truck is on their mobile phone on their way to their site, we, we're gonna miss that opportunity. So just building on that a little bit further and taking this as the opportunity for the second of the q and I mean, just thinking about that in terms of, um, you know, reporting lines, in there, and people talk about solid and dotted reporting lines, right? When you've got a CEO, and that's the privilege of a leader, you know, you've got one person in all these areas, you know, r- reporting lines, hard lines to, you know, four or five direct reports that are beneath that. Mm. And then those four or five will have another four or five. And so you end up getting this question where, well, you know, is, is person A and person, you know, L and person N who report to three different things. Should they be in some dotted reporting line here or hard reporting line? I mean, can you can you demystify that conversation for us and work out? You know, cross-functional sounds good. People have got a boss and a you know and a performance plan they've got to work out. Mm. How do you make cross-functional work when people are looking at reporting lines and working out the dots and the colours and all that sort of stuff? Firstly, I think if I'd, if I'd completely cracked this, I'd be like the new Stephen Covey of things, <laughs> so, right. so, uh, so I won't pretend that there's any easy solutions. And, and I, I also should say, while I, while I do defend the, um, you know, the sort of command and control nature of the military, it is a bit of a myth. I tell you what we do do well is lines and, and yeah. boxes, right? Yeah, you can so, talk, talk so, us through that, yeah. You know, the military... How do you um, do cross-functional boxes? Well, you know, it's interesting. Scenarios. So we generally, we, you know, in the military, we, gen- we, we used to train in pure organisations, but we deployed as cross-functional teams. And so oh, that's, um, that, uh, that's, that's always been an interesting mindset. So for example, if you're a, if you're a, I, was a I was a tank crewman, a tank on its own is very vulnerable to, to um, drones or anti-armor teams. So you, you've got to have tanks and infantry and artillery and electronic warfare and cyber. So, but the idea is that first you must be master of your excellence. So until you can bring your complete, fully trained, capable self to that team, you're not as useful. So there's a period of, 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 a, of a training rotation where you master your particular area of the business, but then you must come together and learn how to cooperate. And that is difficult. And I, the best analogy I can use is the orchestra. 
So the, you, you first you've got to be able to play your violin, then you've got to be able to play the violin with, with the other uh, string players, then you've got to be able to come together as an orchestra under the direction of somebody um, and, and learn how to read them and trust them and, and, and interact with each other. So this, uh, this, this notion of um, you know, the cross-functional team has is, is been around for a while. Sir John Monash, a lot of Australians might have heard of, as perhaps Australia's most significant military leader in history, World War I leader, um, you know, frankly, anti-establishment um, militia general, so many had come from the reserve. He had a Jewish background, so he got up the nose of the British aristocracy. But he brought to military uh, theory and practice this notion of the combined arms team, the cross-functional mm. team. And he had a famous quote that he said, it's not the infantry's job to, you know, to die on the machine guns or, or, or the barbed wire of the enemy. It's the job of the tanks to, to, you know, to, to suppress and the aircraft. And so he was one of the first leaders who had mm. tanks and artillery and aircraft in support of Australian soldiers. So, so you know, this notion's been around for a while, but the fact that we're still talking about it means it's hard. Mm. And it, I come back to teamwork and trust. Mm. If senior leaders trust each other and are willing to cooperate, what I often find down below, subordinate leaders don't bother arguing. Mm, yeah. But if there's preciousness and protectiveness and senior leaders are protecting their patch and their span of authority, then guess what will happen mm. below them? Mm. Best organisations, you don't even notice it. Mm. Organisations that are struggling, it's, it's prickly. Mm. You can't speak to anyone without the permission of their leader and, and everyone's experienced it and it's toxic. Mm. Um, but look, if I had the secret sauce for cracking that one, um, you know, I, I, I think I'd be... Um, <laughs> it's a lot of books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, mate, because I can see in that we've picked off some of our other questions, right? How do you create a culture of collaboration amongst other things? Final question for you, Gus. So, you know, you've had the privilege, um, you know, to serve uh, uh, for the Australian um, forces, but alongside counterparts, you know, in America and the UK and others. And, and I just wondered how you think about you know, Australia in a global context in the business community. I mean, you know, we're, you know the, the, the kind of implicit element in life in a digital age is we live in a country which is an island and the borders are closed. Yeah. You know, how, how is our business future as a, in business or as a, in, in politics or beyond in the region going to be advanced, you think, in, in the forward years? And, and how do we begin to play a role in the region, you think? You know, clearly we play that in a defence context, but yeah. going into business and, and, and commerce, um, how, how, how do you see that playing out in the, in the years ahead? I hope we've got a little bit of time left because <laughs> you, you, you're going to ignite just, another area of passion, uh, Eric. Um, you know, look, we are, we are um, you know, we're blessed to have extraordinary people. We've got a wonderful education system that produces talented, um, creative people. In fact, you don't need to look at, I think education is our fourth largest export. And what are we exporting? We're exporting knowledge, but frankly, we're exporting creativity um, uh, and, and uh, innovation. And so I think the challenge for us as a nation is, is let's harness more of that here. I've been, uh, you know, one of the roles I've enjoyed in, in the uh, university sector since leaving the military was trying to help universities connect with business because um, that's an example of the gap where we have tremendous creat creativity uh, an opportunity, but we have this chasm which is which is created by lack of investment, lack of understanding, and a connection to industry, where a view is industry has to find that solution somewhere else. So national resilience, I think, is important. COVID has exposed that nations are going to need to be able to do certain things themselves. The fact that we uh, we can't produce an MNRA, and I might be criticised for getting that wrong, a vaccine, a genetically mm -hmm. modified vaccine yes. in Australia, you know, I think we should be embarrassed by now. I don't say that in a political sense. I say that because as a nation, we knew how to do that. We've got, edu mm. we've got universities who know how to mm. do that, but we hadn't mobilised that capability nationally. Um, when you look at uh, the implications of the threat in cyberspace, if we can't uh, defend ourselves, if we can't operate safely in cyberspace and be really resilient as a nation, we, we stand exposed. The this recent um, outage in the cloud, which I gather was a technical outage, but gives us a taste of what a cyber attack might be. So smart nations are going to be able to, going to have to have these higher order skills. Now, my old world, the government, you know, that has appeared to have chosen to try and stimulate advanced manufacturing, 
with these incredibly expensive and complex submarines. Mm. Well, we better as a nation get that right. Mm. You know, I, yeah. I, I don't know what the number, the latest number I've heard, but let's say it's in the order of sixty billion dollars. Yeah. I think it's a legitimate attempt to stimulate complex manufacturing. But what that means is we really have to have that followed through, audited and and made sure it happens because that's enormous investment. You know, put simply, in my view, invest, defence investment should give $2 worth of value for every dollar of spend. Yeah. One, you get a defence effect, but the second effect better be an Australian job in a high-skilled environment where, where we're retaining capability in the nation. My challenge to future leaders is, I think I would assess we're probably perhaps five to seven years behind in the adoption of artificial intelligence, machine learning, machine assistance. Um, I think at a, you know, at a big organisation like Borrell, one of the skills that we are desperately seeking to find is data analytics, you know, capability, ability to visualise. So, you know, these are things that I think we, we've got some work to do. We have the capacity, we've got the creativity, we've got the wonderful people. But we've got to now put it at the forefront. We can't just dig our backyard up and put it on a ship and think yeah. that's going to sustain us. Well, Gus, I think at this point we'd be hearing rounds of applause. Uh, we're going to have another event with that in mind to be able to extend on this story, but also kind of bring into the uh, into your um, earlier years. But for now, um, can I thank you, one of the country's leading military leaders, one of the country's leading business leaders, coming to Macquarie Business School today to share your pearls of wisdom. Thank you very much. No, pleasure to be here, and uh, and and this is such an important environment. Like this is the future leaders. I've had my crack, um, and uh, it's a really exciting time to be leading and and. And go and stand next to the biggest problem and, um, and solve it. Thanks so much, Gus. Thank you. Thank you.